In this lesson, let's talk about context mapping, which is a tool in the Domain Driven Design Toolbox that helps us visualize and understand the relationships between bounded contexts and the teams. And let's start by looking at the three types of team relationships. Two teams or bounded contexts are mutually dependent when their software artifacts or systems need to be delivered together to be successful and to work. You often see a close reciprocal link between the data and the functionalities of these teams, and they tend to need a lot of communication between each other in order to coordinate their efforts, which often shows up in the partnership pattern in context maps, which we will see in a moment. And then there's the upstream downstream relationship, as you can see with the U and the D labels, which you see in many examples later as well. In these relationships, the actions of an upstream team will have an effect on the downstream team, but the actions of the downstream team do not have a significant impact on the upstream team. As you can imagine, this power dynamic is pretty one-sided and puts the downstream team in a precarious position, and that's why they will often need some protection. And you often find anti-corruption layers deployed in situations like this, but more on that later. And lastly, Two teams or bounded contexts can be free from each other's influence if changes in one bounded context do not influence the other's success or failure. There is therefore no organizational or technical link of any kind between these two teams. So those are the three types of relationships between teams, and depending on what relationship you have with another team, you may observe one of these nine patterns in play. Sometimes you may even see multiple patterns at once, so let's go through these one by one, starting with the open host service pattern, which is often abbreviated to OHS. It's a shared API that provides some common functionality to multiple consumers. The team that provides the open host service is an upstream team. So the aforementioned upstream downstream power dynamic is at play, where the downstream team can often find themselves at the whim of the upstream team. So an anti-corruption layer or ACL is often deployed in the client application to translate the model from the upstream bounded context or system to the internal model that the client application understands. It reduces the coupling between these two bounded contexts to just this one layer. And this idea of an adapter might sound familiar to you if you cast your mind back to the Hasakono architecture lecture from week two. The adapters serve as an anti-corruption layer and protects our core domain logic from changes in the upstream system and allows us to stay loosely coupled. It does, however, require time and effort to implement because you have to write your application in a particular way and put those abstraction layers in place ahead of time, but sometimes you can't afford to do that. And that's when you will see the conformist pattern where the downstream system just uses the upstream model directly. This has a higher coupling, but it's simpler and gives you higher velocity in the short term. It can be a useful tactical move if it's done intentionally, with a plan to eventually pay back the technical debt. Another thing to consider here is that if the conformist approach is taken across multiple bounded contexts, then you can create hidden coupling between systems where changes in one can propagate all the way to another that it has no direct links with. And that's not a good place to be because changes now require a lot of coordination between teams and that can be very expensive. Having said that, this conformist approach can work if the upstream is stable. For example, if it implements an industry standard specification. But in general, we need to have good boundaries between teams so the teams can have the autonomy to make their own decisions and do the best job they can. Another approach is shared kernel, in which two teams have some shared artifact in their system. It might be a shared NPM module or even a shared database. This has a high degree of coupling and requires a lot of coordination between the teams. I wouldn't label it as an anti-pattern just yet, but you do want to use this with caution. But having said that, there are some cases where this can work really well. For example, when a team is responsible for two bounded contexts and there are some overlap between these two in terms of the language. But typically, when you have two teams with shared kernels, then they should really form a partnership instead. To quote the DDD reference book by Eric Evans, where development failure in either of two bounded contexts would result in delivery failure of both, then forge a partnership between the teams in charge of the two bounded contexts. 
institute a process for coordinated planning of development and the joint management of integration. The teams must cooperate on the evolution of the interfaces to accommodate the development needs of both systems. Independent features should be scheduled so that they are completed for the same release. The partnership pattern is not really a technical pattern, it's purely an organization one and is recommended for teams with a shared kernel. And the one thing to look out for with this pattern is when a team enters into a partnership with multiple other teams. Because when this happens, this team in the middle usually find themselves inundated with meetings and struggles to find time to get any actual work done. And they suffer from a lack of agency where they can't even set their own agenda because they have too many partners to satisfy. And that's also not a good place to be. Another organizational pattern is the customer supplier pattern for teams with an upstream downstream relationship where the upstream team gives the downstream team some influence on its priorities and backlog. So the power dynamic between them is no longer one-sided. But you should avoid having too many customer relationships and yield too much influence to the customers, such as giving them the ability to veto your planned changes. Because again, the team in the middle is going to lose much of its autonomy as its roadmap becomes driven by its customers. And you end up spending a lot of time in meetings to prioritize requirements and the juggling between the different requirements from all these different customers. And instead of a shared kernel, which tightly couples two bounded contexts through shared implementation details, they may be loosely coupled through a shared language instead where every bounded context can translate in and out of this language and do the appropriate thing within their respective bounded contexts. And this pattern is often combined with the open host service pattern, in which case the shared language will often come in the form of a well-defined API. For example, many e-commerce platforms integrate with Stripe for payment processing through a published language in the form of a well-defined API where Stripe is the open host service and the e-commerce platforms are independent of each other. And they each translate the messages from the shared language in and out of their bounded context, possibly through anti-corruption layers. And for teams that have a free relationship or when there are no technical integration between two bounded contexts with possibly only a manual process to integrate them, we have the separate ways pattern. It's an interesting pattern for building minimum viable products because it avoids direct integrations, which can be expensive or time consuming to implement. And the last pattern is the dreaded big ball of mud where you have a mess of different models all mixed together and there are inconsistent boundaries everywhere. And to prevent the upstream mess from propagating into your bounty context, an anti-corruption layer is the pattern of choice here. So those are the nine common patterns some of these are technical patterns, others are organizational, and some are both. And if we group them by team relationships, then we might get something like this, where mutually dependent teams can form partnerships and sometimes they might even have a shared kernel, which as we said before, should be used with caution. And the teams that are free from each other's influence either go their separate ways and have no technical integration, or they are loosely coupled only through a shared published language which often comes in the form of a well-defined API. And for teams with an upstream downstream relationship, you will often see an open host service with either a conformist or anti-corruption layer approach to allow or stop the upstream model from propagating into the downstream. This type of relationship typically has a one-sided power dynamic. Unless the teams engage in a customer supplier pattern where the upstream team allows the downstream team some influence over its roadmap, and there is another way to map these patterns and that is to consider the amount of coupling between teams and therefore the amount of communication overhead you would have when you engage in these patterns, which again is a very useful derivative of this exercise to better understand how our systems and teams actually work. Okay, so I hope you've learned something useful and I'll see you in the next lesson. Hi, I hope you have enjoyed this video and if you do, why not check out these other videos and learn more about serverless development?